Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over section one, i.e. the multiple choice questions from the 2015 SQA National 5 Physics exam paper. Now, there are 20 questions in this section, and I recommend that you try them yourself before looking at these solutions. So let's get started. Question one says that two circuits are set up as shown. So we've got meter X connected in series with this resistor R, and we've got this circuit over here with a battery, resistor R with a meter Y in parallel with it, and meter Z in series. It then says both circuits are used to determine the resistance of resistor R. Which row in the table identifies meter X, meter Y, and meter Z? And you can see the options here, we've got ammeter, voltmeter, and ohmmeter. Well, let's look back at the picture. In order to find the resistance of a resistor purely with one device, it's going to be the ohmmeter because that measures the resistance of a component. So meter X has got to be the ohmmeter. Meter Y has got to be something in parallel with the resistor. And remember, we connect voltmeters in parallel with the component. So that's going to be the voltmeter. And that leaves this component being an ammeter. And that's because, remember, an ammeter is connected in series with a component. And you might be thinking, well, how does the voltmeter and the ammeter allow you to determine the resistance of resistor R? And remember, that's through Ohm's law, V equals IR. So if you know the voltage across the resistor and you know the current through the resistor, then you can work out the resistance of the resistor. So in order X, Y, and Z, we have ohmmeter, voltmeter, and ammeter, which is going to be an answer of A, ohmmeter, voltmeter, and ammeter. Question two says, which of the following statements is or are correct? Statement one says, the voltage of a battery is the number of joules of energy it gives to each coulomb of charge. Statement two, a battery only has a voltage when it is connected in a complete circuit. And statement three, electrons are free to move within an insulator. Well, statement one, first of all, that is our definition of voltage or potential difference. The voltage of a battery is the number of joules of energy it gives to each coulomb of charge. So that is true. Statement two, a battery only has a voltage when it is connected in a complete circuit. That is false because voltage or potential difference is a property of the battery itself. So it doesn't need to be in a complete circuit for it to have a voltage. And lastly, statement three, electrons are free to move within an insulator. Where remember, electrons are able to move freely within a conductor, which is how we get current passing through a conductor like a metal. But insulators do not have any freely moving electrons. So this one is false. So we have statement one is the only correct one, which gives us an answer of A. Question three says that a circuit is set up as shown. So we've got a four ohm resistor in series with a parallel combination of four ohms and four ohms. The resistance between X and Y is. So we need to do combination circuits for our resistors here. So we have four ohms in series with this parallel combination. So let's do the parallel bit first and then add on four to our answer at the end. Now you could use the equation here or you can use a shortcut to get the answer. So let's use the equation first and then I'll show you what the shortcut is. So using the equation for the parallel part first, we have one over RT equals one over R1 plus one over R2. Summing in the numbers, we got one over 4.0 plus one over 4.0, which gives us two over 4.0. So that means RT, when we flip both sides, gives us RT equals 4.0 over two, which is two ohms. And then we can add the four ohms to the two ohm resistor in series. So we have RT equals R1 plus R2 which equals 4.0 plus 2.0, which equals 6.0 ohms, which is going to give us an answer of C. However, you could do this a bit quicker by identifying that because these two resistors are identical and because there's two of them, then we can take the value of one of them and half it, divide it by the number of resistors. So there's two. So we can take the number of value of one of them, which is four ohms, divide it by the two resistors, which gives us two, and add it on to the four to get six ohms. Now remember that trick only works when the resistors in parallel have identical values. Question four says that the rating plate on an electrical appliance is shown. So we have 230 volts, 50 hertz, 920 watts, and the model is HD1055. The resistance of this appliance is, well notice we're asked for resistance, we've got a power of 920 watts, and a voltage of 230 volts. So you should be thinking of an equation that relates resistance, power, and voltage. And this is one of our power equations. So remember we have P equals V squared over R as one of our four power equations. You could then plug in the numbers at this stage or rearrange first for R. So I'm going to rearrange by cross multiplying or swapping the P and R round. So we get R equals V squared over P. Substituting in the numbers gives 230 squared over 920, which if you put into your calculator should give you an answer of 57.5 ohms. So that is an answer of E here. Question 5 says that a syringe containing air is sealed at one end as shown. The piston is pushed in slowly. 
there is no change in temperature of the air inside the syringe. Which of the following statements describes and explains the change in pressure of the air in the syringe? So we have the pressure increases because the air particles have more kinetic energy. The pressure increases because the air particles hit the sides of the syringe more frequently. The pressure increases because the air particles hit the sides of the syringe less frequently. The pressure decreases because the air particles hit the sides of the syringe with less force and the pressure decreases because the air particles have less kinetic energy. Well, here we're thinking about particles in a box, or otherwise known as the kinetic model, or kinetic theory of gases. So in the kinetic model, we said that particles in a box will exert a force on the walls of the container, and it's all to do with their number of collisions with the walls of the container. And we're thinking about the syringe here and how the piston is pushed in. So what we're doing there is we are decreasing the volume that the particles have to move around in, and that is going to increase the pressure, and it's to do with more collisions. So we could say that it's going to be answer B here because it's due to the air particles hitting the sides of the syringe more frequently, i.e. there's more collisions each second when you decrease volume, which causes the pressure to increase. So this question is all about Boyle's law, or the pressure and volume law, which says that pressure and volume are inversely proportional, or in other words, as one decreases, the other one has to increase. Question 6 says that the pressure of a fixed mass of gas is 150 kilopascals at a temperature of 27 degrees Celsius. The temperature of the gas is now increased to 47 degrees Celsius. The volume of the gas remains constant. The pressure of the gas is now... So because we've got a constant volume and we've got pressure and temperature changing, this is suggesting that we're dealing with the pressure and temperature law, otherwise known as gay lussacs law. And we should also notice that the temperatures are given in degrees Celsius and not in Kelvin, so we will have to change those temperatures into Kelvin in order to use this equation. So we have P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2 for gay lussacs law. We're trying to find the new pressure of the gas, so we're going to say that is P2, and we can substitute in the numbers for P1, T1, and T2. So we have for P1, 150 kilopascals, and I'm changing that into pascals with 150 times 10 to the 3, divided by 27 for T1, plus the 273 to change it into Kelvin. This is equal to P2 divided by 47 for temperature T2, plus the 273 to change it into Kelvin. And we can simplify both sides and then cross multiply. So we do the thing in the bottom left times the thing in the top right, is equal to the thing in the top left times the thing in the bottom right. So this gives us 300 P2 is equal to 4.8 times 10 to the 7. And now we can divide both sides by 300 to get P2 on its own. So this gives us P2 equals 1.6 times 10 to the 5 pascals, which is the same as 160,000 pascals, or in other words, 160 kilopascals, which gives an answer of D. Question 7 says the diagram represents a water wave. The wavelength of the water waves is. Well, notice here we've got a distance from this point to this point of 18 millimetres, and we've got a full vertical height of 4 millimetres. Well, remember, wavelength is nothing to do with vertical height. That would be amplitude, which is half the vertical height, so we can ignore this distance here. We're simply just looking at the 18 millimetres here, and first of all, I want to count how many full waves I have here. So remember, a full wave goes from this point all the way up, all the way down, and back to the start. So I have one wave, two waves, three waves. So I've got three waves here with a distance of 18 millimetres. So that means to get the distance from here to here, which is one wavelength, that's got to be the 18 divided by the three waves, which gives me the wavelength of one wave. So the wavelength lambda is equal to 18 divided by three, which is six millimetres. So that's going to be the answer D. Question 8 says a student makes the following statements about different types of electromagnetic waves. Statement 1 says that light waves are transverse waves. Statement 2 says that radio waves travel at 340 meters per second through air. And statement 3, ultraviolet waves have a longer wavelength than infrared waves. Which of these statements is or are correct? Well, let's look through each statement and decide which ones are true or false. So statement 1, first of all, says light waves are transverse waves. This is true, because remember light waves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and all waves in the electromagnetic spectrum are transverse. Radio waves travel at 340 meters per second through air. That is false, because remember radio waves, even though it sounds like they're sound waves because it's to do with the radio, radio waves are actually part of the electromagnetic spectrum, remember. So that means they travel at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, the speed of light. And lastly, statement 3, ultraviolet waves have a longer wavelength than infrared waves. That is false due to the order of the members of the electromagnetic spectrum. So remember, going from longest wavelength to shortest wavelength, we have radio and TV, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays. 
So infrared comes before ultraviolet, so infrared actually has a longer wavelength than ultraviolet. So that means that only statement 1 here is correct, which is A. So question 9 says that alpha radiation ionizes an atom. Which statement describes what happens to the atom? Well, we have the atom splits in half, the atom releases a neutron, the atom becomes positively charged, the atom gives out gamma radiation, or the atom releases heat. Well, remember ionization is to do with an atom losing or gaining an electron to become either a positive ion or a negative ion. So if an atom loses an electron through ionization, then it can become positively charged and therefore become a positive ion. So the answer here is C, the atom becomes positively charged. Question 10 says that a sample of tissue is irradiated using a radioactive source. A student makes the following statements. So the equivalent dose received by the tissue is reduced by shielding the tissue with a lead screen, increased as the distance from the source to the tissue is increased, increased by increasing the time of exposure of the tissue to the radiation. Which of the statements is or are correct? Well, let's look through each statement and decide which ones are true or false. So statement one, first of all, the equivalent dose is reduced by shielding the tissue with a lead screen. That's going to be true, because remember lead is a good absorber of radiation. It's going to absorb all of alpha, all of beta, and most of gamma, but remember it doesn't absorb all the gamma rays, because some will still get through lead. But it will do a good job at reducing the equivalent dose. We then have the equivalent dose received is increased as the distance from the source to the tissue is increased. Well, that is false, because if you increase your distance from the source, then it's going to be safer. So you're going to be receiving a smaller equivalent dose if you're further away. So that is false because the opposite is true. And lastly, statement three, the equivalent dose is increased by increasing the time of exposure of the tissue to the radiation. That is true because if you're exposed for long periods of time as opposed to short periods of time, then you're going to receive more equivalent dose, more radiation. So that means we have one and three that are correct here, which gives an answer of E. Question 11 says a sample of tissue receives an absorbed dose of 16 micrograys from alpha particles. The radiation weighting factor for alpha particles is 20. The equivalent dose received by the sample is. So in order to find the equivalent dose, when we're given the radiation weighting factor and the absorbed dose, remember we can use this equation H equals D times WR. And we can substitute in the numbers so we have 16 micrograys for the absorbed dose, which remember with this prefix micro is 16 times 10 to the minus 6 times the 20 for the radiation weighting factor. So putting that into your calculator gives an answer of 3.2 times 10 to the minus 4 sieverts, which is the same as 320 times 10 to the minus 6 sieverts if we move the decimal point two places to the right, or in other words, 320 micro sieverts. So this gives us the answer of E here. Moving on to question 12, we have for a particular radioactive source, 240 atoms decay in one minute. The activity of this source is, well because we've got the number of atoms or nuclei decaying and we've got a time, then we can use the activity equation, A equals N over T. So substituting in the numbers, we have 240 atoms or nuclei divided by 60, which is the time in seconds, because remember this equation only works when time is in seconds. So putting that into your calculator, or just doing it in your head, if we cancel a zero out, 24 divided by 6 is the same as 4 becquerels. So this gives us an answer of A. Question 13 says the letters X, Y and Z represent missing words from the following passage. During a nuclear something reaction, two nuclei of smaller mass combine to produce a nucleus of large mass number. During a nuclear something reaction, a nucleus of larger mass splits into two nuclei of smaller mass number. Both of these reactions are important because these processes can release something. Which row in the table shows the missing words? Well, the first statement is describing two nuclei of smaller mass combining to produce a larger nucleus, which means it must be a nuclear fusion reaction. So we've got two nuclei fusing together. So we have fusion for the first one, which means it's going to be an answer of A, C, or E. Then statement Y is describing a larger nucleus or mass splitting into two smaller nuclei. And that is describing a nuclear fission reaction. So we have fusion and then fission. And both of these reactions release energy in the form of heat. So we have fusion, fission, and energy, which is going to be an answer of E. Question 14 says, which of the following quantities is fully described by its magnitude? In other words, which of these quantities is a scalar, i.e. it's only described by a magnitude, it doesn't have a direction? Well, if we look at each of these, force is a vector, displacement is a vector, velocity is a vector, and acceleration is also a vector. So the only scalar here is energy. 
Question 15 says the table shows the velocities of three objects x, y and z over a period of 3 seconds. Each object is moving in a straight line. So we'll get time in seconds and we've then got velocity of x, velocity of y and velocity of z in meters per second. Then says which of the following statements is or are correct. Statement 1 says x moves with constant velocity. Statement 2, y moves with constant acceleration. And statement 3, z moves with constant acceleration. Well, statement 1, first of all, x moves with constant velocity. Let's look at velocity of x against time. So we've got a velocity of x going up in 2s from 2, 4, 6 and 8. So that suggests that it's got a constant acceleration because it's increasing in velocity by the same amount over each second. But the velocity is not staying the same. It's obviously not constant. So that means that statement 1 has to be false. Statement 2, y moves with constant acceleration. Well, we can see that for y, we've got the velocity increasing by 1 over each second, which means that it is a constant acceleration, so that is true. And statement 3, z moves with constant acceleration. Well, at 0 seconds, we've got a velocity of 0 meters per second. At 1 second, it's at 2. At 2 seconds, it's at 5 meters per second. And then at 9 meters per second after 3 seconds. So you can see there's a jump of 2 meters per second here then 3, and then 4 meters per second. So that suggests that the acceleration is actually increasing, it's not constant. So that is also false. So this means that our only statement that's true is 2, which gives us an answer of B. Question 16 says that a car of mass 1,200 kilograms is travelling along a straight level road at a constant speed of 20 meters per second. The driving force of the car is 2,500 newtons, and the frictional force on the car is also 2,500 newtons. So we've got the car there moving with constant speed of 20 meters per second, it's moving along this road, and we've got a distance between x and y of 50 meters. It then says the work done moving the car between point x and point y is... Well, well remember our equation for work done is EW equals F times D. We've got our distance D of 50 meters here, and in order to get our force, some of you might be thinking that the force is going to be the unbalanced force, so it's going to be the driving force minus the frictional force. However, that would give us a force of zero newtons, which would mean that the work done is zero. But that is not the case, because this car must be doing work in order to move. So the work done cannot be zero on this car to move. Usually you would find the unbalanced force on an object, but because it cannot be zero in this case, we need to take the driving force or the thrust force. So if we take the driving force or the thrust force of 2,500 newtons, then we get a work done of 2,500 times 50, and putting that into your calculator gives a final answer of 125,000 newtons, which gives an answer of C. Question 17 says that a person sits on a chair which rests on the earth. The person exerts a downward force on the chair. Which of the following is the reaction to this force? Well, this is a question relating to Newton's third law, specifically a Newton pair. And remember when dealing with Newton pairs, you basically just have to swap the words in the sentence. So the reaction to this action force, the, the person exerts a downward force on the chair, is going to be that the chair exerts a force upwards on the person. So we have the force of the chair on the person, which is the answer A. Question 18 says that a package falls vertically from a helicopter. After some time, the package reaches its terminal velocity. A group of students make the following statements about the package when it reaches its terminal velocity. Statement 1 says the weight of the package is less than the air resistance acting on the package. Statement 2, the forces acting on the package are balanced. And statement 3, the package is accelerating towards the ground at 9.8 meters per second squared. Which of these statements is or are correct? Well, let's go through each statement and decide which ones are true or false. So statement one, the weight of the package is less than the air resistance acting on the package. Well, this has got to be false because remember when an object reaches terminal velocity, the forces acting vertically on it are balanced to cause it to fall at a constant speed, i.e. the terminal velocity. So that means that the weight and the air resistance need to be balanced, so you can't have one bigger or smaller than the other. So that has got to be false. Statement two, the forces acting in the package are balanced. We just said that is true for terminal velocity. And lastly, the package is accelerating towards the ground at 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, you might think this is true because all objects have gravity acting on them downwards. However, we can't have that the package is balanced and falling at a constant velocity, i.e. the terminal velocity, and accelerating downwards. It has to be doing one or the other, either traveling at a constant speed or accelerating. So the fact that it's traveling at a constant speed or velocity, i.e. the terminal velocity, means it cannot be accelerating as well. So that has got to be false. So that means our only correct statement is 2, so that means our answer must be B. 
Question 19 says that the distance from the Sun to Proxima Centauri is 4.3 light years. This distance is equivalent to. Well, you can see the final answers are in meters, and we want to therefore convert from light years into meters. So remember to do this, you can either remember what one light year is in meters, i.e. 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters, and you can multiply the 4.3 by this distance of one light year in meters, which is equal to 4.1 times 10 to the 16 meters. Or if you don't think you'll be able to remember that one light year is 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters, you can do a speed distance time calculation here. So we're trying to find distance from D equals VT. We use the speed of light because we're talking about light here. So it's three times 10 to the eight times the time for one year in seconds. So that's 365 days times 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds, and then multiply that by the 4.3 for the light years. Because the speed here times the time for one light year in seconds, that will only give us one light year in meters. So we need to times it by the 4.3, which if you put into your calculator gives us again 4.1 times 10 to the 16 meters. So that means the answer here is E. Lastly, question 20 says that light from a star is split into a line spectrum of different colours. The line spectrum from the star is shown, along with the line spectra of the elements calcium, helium, hydrogen and sodium. So we've got the line spectrum from the star at the top, and then the line spectra for all the other elements here. And because the top spectrum is the line spectrum from the star, we're going to be referring back to this one for each of these. So it says the elements present in the star are... So remember, in order to do this question, we need to basically match up the lines of the elements with the lines in the spectrum from the star. And to find if the elements are present in the star, the lines must match up. So first of all, calcium, we can see that there's a line here and there's a line here that are not included in the spectrum from the star. So that means calcium is not in the star. We then get helium with two lines here. They match up to these two in the top spectrum. We then get this line that matches with this one, this one and this one, and this one and this one. So we could say with confidence that helium is in the spectrum of the star. Then get hydrogen with a line here that matches up with this one here. We've got this thicker line on the left, which lines up with this line up here. So again, we could say that hydrogen is included in the spectrum from the star. And lastly, sodium, where we've got this line here, which does match with this one, but we've got an extra line next to it, which is not in the spectrum for the star. We've also got this line over here, which doesn't appear in the spectrum of the star. So sodium is not present in the star. So we can conclude, therefore, that helium and hydrogen are present in the star, but none of the others are. So this gives an answer of D, helium and hydrogen. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching, if you made it to the end I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.